now that we've talked pretty in depth about what JavaScript is and how it works as a client side technology, I wanted to touch on something called JSON. And um, you may have heard of it or you may have seen it before. But what it stands for is JavaScript Object Notation. And you remember I said that JavaScript has a number of ways in which it overlaps with Java, though it's not directly Java based. But one of the things that uh, JavaScript uh, is good for is its object oriented nature. So the reason objects are nice to deal with, and you can think of this in any object oriented language, which includes Java or Python or PHP, is the use of objects relates to us sort of as human beings, right? So Java is based on classes and a class represents a real life object. So for example, take a class that represents a car. And in Java, the, there are basically two main things that describe that car. One is its set of attributes. So the car might have a make, a model, a miles per gallon, uh, wheel diameter, you know, a number of features related to the car. And the other thing that real life objects have are behavior. So um, in addition to the attributes, Java models the behavior as methods or functions. So it's really handy to deal with objects uh, in, in computer programming and JSON is a way to take data, uh, specifically JavaScript data, and deal with it as an object. So JSON just stands for JavaScript Object Notation and it is a text-based way to represent data in JavaScript. And I wrote here, you see the word serialization. And what I mean by serialization is Sometimes when working with JavaScript, you know, we're working with raw data and serialization refers to converting a JavaScript object from raw data to this JSON standard. And deserialization is just the opposite. It's we take JSON data as input and then we convert it into JavaScript objects. So what I mean by that is you can see down below that JavaScript, or excuse, uh, excuse me, JSON is based on just two super duper simple structures that you will come across in a number of different programming language languages. The first one is a key value pair. So you see in the example that my object, my obj, uh, is equal to uh, what we call in Python a dictionary. And a dictionary is simply a mapping from a key to a value. And a dictionary can have multiple key value pairs. So you see here, we have my object appears to refer to a person, and a person has a name. So in this case, the name is John, uh, an age, which is 30, and a car, which in this case is null. So it appears that John doesn't have a car. But you can see how we can use a set or uh, a number of key value pairs to represent this specific object. So very straightforward and very simple. And as I said, in Python, specifically, they call this data structure a dictionary. In Java, you may call it a map. In C, you might call it a struct. But those all kind of represent the same underlying data structure. The other thing that JSON is based on are arrays. So you can see here in the example below, we have something called D. And D is again a dictionary. And you can see that it has three key value pairs. The first one is first name. The second one is second name. And the third one is called titles. But in this case, this guy Guido Rossum could potentially have multiple titles. So you can see here that the key is titles, but the value uh, is actually an array of values. So titles maps to a, uh, in Python, we call this a list. In C++, you may call this a vector or a number of different names for the data structure. But basically, it's your standard array. Uh, so you can see that JSON is really just a collection of key value pairs. And sometimes we have uh, lists as well. So we'll see that this, this notation is really nice for, uh, it's really nice to use for data transfer because it's human readable. It's very simple to understand, and it's actually very fast to parse. And so we'll talk a little bit more about JSON in the next slide. JSON is actually somewhat similar to XML, 
So if you're familiar with XML, it stands for Extensible Markup Language. And they both sort of serve the same purpose. They're supposed to be a nice data model where you have a sort of schema that maps to objects. And you can take your raw data, convert it into an XML or a JSON object. You can send it over the network or over a socket or in, you know, through a file or one of a number of ways. And then they, the receiver on the other end can take that file or they can take that stream from a network. And if they know your schema, they can convert it from JSON or XML into an object in the language of their choice on the other end. So the nice thing is that many languages have support for parsing both XML and JSON. Uh, JSON has the advantage that it's much lighter weight than XML. And its schema, since it's just a bunch of key value pairs or key to array pairs or arrays of key value pairs, uh, it's much lighter weight and it's much more flexible. So one of these languages is called JSONify, and JSONify is a library in a web framework called Flask, which is written in Python, and that's something you're going to get a chance to get some experience with. You're actually going to write a web service in this week's assignment. So again, to serialize an object, it means to take an object in the language of your choice and convert it to JSON. You transmit it somehow to some consumer, and on the other end, they're going to deserialize it or parse it from JSON back into an object in the language of their choosing. So I wanted to give you an example you can see here below. We have a dictionary, and the first name is Roy. The last name is Augustine. And we are adding entries to this dictionary twice. And you can see in the convert to JSON line, it says uh, JSON string is equal to json.dumps of employee list. Employee list is just contains uh, two sets of two key value pairs. Each one of those sets contains a first name and a last name. And you can see how easy it is to convert it to a JSON string and return JSONify just returns the JSON encoded version of your object. So the languages make this super simple. It's literally a one-liner, whereas if you had to write a parser manually, which used to be the case, it would take you much, much, much longer to do. Uh, but now it's very common that it's supported simply in just one line. And as I said, JSONify is, is what we're going to work with here in this week's Module 2 assignment. While JSON is a nice way to be able to exchange data, we're going to talk about something called a REST endpoint. And these are often used for something called a web API which is an application programming interface. Rust endpoints are a really nice encapsulated way to leverage HTTP more or less to exchange data over the web. So REST stands for representational state transfer. And what REST is at a high level, it's just an architecture. It's a way that allows you to use HTTP to perform remote function calls to more or less exchange data. Remember in the very first slide we talked about today, we have a number of HTTP verbs. We have a get, which is a retrieves a read-only copy of something. We have a put, which allows us to put a file onto a web server. We have a delete. We have a post, which is like an update. So if you ever hear the acronym CRUD, C-R-U-D, it stands for create, read, update, and delete which are the four main verbs that HTTP supports. So the nice thing is that since these calls are transported over the HTTP protocol, it gives us a nice way to hit endpoints at different parts of the internet. So these endpoints don't just have to be locally. It allows us to reach out over the web. For example, uh, here's just a, a pretty random example, but if we wanted to reach out to ESPN or Facebook or Twitter or Best Buy, they allow us to interact with their data. And the way that they do that is though they will publish an endpoint. So for example, if we want to retrieve, say, Best Buy prices on TVs, they take a REST endpoint and they publish it to the world. And we can subscribe to that endpoint. We can do a GET request against it. And then we're able to pull back data that we can somehow use in our own application. So you see here, we use a uniform resource indicator 
in order to accomplish that. And all a URI is, it's very similar to a URL, so it's related to HTTP, but it's basically the path by which you access this endpoint. So you see in this case, there's an endpoint named customers. It takes uh, probably some customer ID that you provide it, and it could return account information uh, for that customer ID. And as we said, these are the most common HTTP verbs. So uh, by and large, when we talked about that CRUD acronym, these are the most common things that you're, the most common ways in which you'll interact with a web API. The interesting thing about web APIs is that even though they're easily accessible and very flexible and very powerful, they're not inherently secure. So just like HTTP is an insecure protocol by default, since REST calls are transported over HTTP, they too are inherently insecure. So here's just a couple of items that you want to think about when you're trying to secure a REST endpoint. So first, as I said, since REST endpoints trans transport over HTTP, it makes sense that you want to support HTTPS if you're exposing a REST endpoint to the world. Otherwise, if you're trying to transmit sensitive data and someone launches a, say, a GET request and they're pulling something from your database, someone who's listening in on a side channel to that communication, they're able to see all the data as it transits from your endpoint to the client who's consuming the data. So we talked about SSL in week one. So the first step to securing a REST endpoint is to make sure that you're using SSL or TLS to actually encrypt the communication between the client and your REST endpoint. The second thing, and you, you definitely have seen this if you've ever subscribed to someone's API before. I mentioned Facebook or Twitter. I've also used ESPN's APIs. I've used Google Maps before, tried to tie some of those features into some of my applications. And they actually require you to register with them. And what they do is they issue you an API key. So it's not just like someone from the outside who knows the endpoint can just say, oh, hey, endpoint, please give me all of your data. Or, hey, endpoint, please delete all of your data. Right? It doesn't work like that. So Google, for example, will make you register, and they give you a long random API key. And you include that key as well as a password in whatever code it is that you're using to access their endpoint. So they're actually able to authenticate all of your API requests. So even though they're technically publicly available, at least they're somewhat well protected in the sense that they know your identity and they are able to authenticate you. So they're willing to exchange data, but they won't just do it with anybody publicly because anybody can connect over the web. So API keys are a mechanism that are used to control access to certain REST endpoints. The other thing along with that to do is to restrict which HTTP methods you're willing to allow uh, to be used to access your data. Remember in the previous slide, we talked about the CRUD acronym, which again is create, read, update, and delete. Perfectly viable that you may want to implement all four. It depends on what the reasons are for exposing your endpoints. Although you may just want to be able to publish data to people and you don't want people to be able to modify your data or certainly not to be able to delete your data. So you may just give them get or post access. Um, so it's up to you. Depends on what your use case is. There are use cases where you may only want get access, where you may only want um, post access. Maybe you want all four or some set thereof. But it makes sense that if you are exchanging data that is maybe somehow sensitive, you definitely don't want it to be openly alterable and certainly not deletable. So restricting which HTTP verbs people have access to to your endpoint can be very important when securing uh, a REST endpoint. Something else that's very, very important that's probably most often overlooked is maintaining audit logs. So as we saw two points ago that most companies force you to use an API access key so that they can monitor what queries you're doing and they can authenticate you as a user. So maintaining audit logs about how people are using your service is very important. But also if there's an error, you don't want to throw anything 
that is too specific, but you still want to be helpful in the event that someone is somehow um, causing an exception when accessing your REST endpoint. And this is true more generally throughout information security. Uh, you want to be able to audit and keep a log of things that have happened to your endpoint, and you want to be able to give the user useful information in the event of an error without be being able to, uh, excuse me, without giving away too much information at the same time. And then finally, I, I decided to put this in capitals because I think it's so important. And it's not just important for REST endpoints, as we saw for some of the countermeasures to the cross-site scripting attacks. It's 100% important that you always validate your input. It is not safe to assume that everyone who's hitting your endpoint is a benign party. In fact, maybe you don't want to assume that at all. Right? You might, might as well start out with the assumption that people who are accessing it are completely untrusted. And so they could be trying to alter your data. They could be trying to steal it. They could be trying to modify it. All of those things are bad for, for different reasons. So it's extremely important that when someone posts a request to your REST endpoint, you want to make sure you validate the input to make sure that they're not trying to do something malicious behind the scenes that could either impact you or other people who are consuming data from your REST endpoint. So if you're interested, um, OWASP maintains a really, really good list of what they call their, their REST security cheat sheet. It's got many, many security implications of REST endpoints if you'd like to read about these topics in more detail or perhaps some other security implications. So please feel free to consult this resource if you're interested. So that brings us to the end of our Module 2 discussions. We talked about client-side technologies and how JavaScript comes into play. We saw a little bit how JavaScript is able to dynamically update web pages using the DOM, which is the document object model. We then talked about stored and reflected cross-site scripting and the differences between the two. And if you're able to join me on Wednesday night, we'll see more specific examples of each and we'll discuss the differences between them a little bit more in depth. We also talked about JSON, which is a little bit of a bridge between some client-side technologies and the server-side technologies that we'll see next week. I definitely wanted to touch on it because JSON is, has basically won out over XML. It's extremely flexible. It's extremely lightweight. It's uh, faster. It's better performing than XML. But in this week's discussion, you're going to talk in depth about some of the security concerns over REST and or excuse me, uh, security concerns over JSON. And specifically, you're going to look at not necessarily any inherent flaws with the design of JSON itself, but more so with the design of how do libraries in various languages handle the JSON. Right? So when you try to take a JSON object and stick it into an array or a specific type in a certain language, the way that different languages do their typing, whether they're weakly typed or strongly typed, I think Python, which is weakly typed, uh, versus Java, which is strongly typed. When you try to stick those JSON objects into actual data types within a programming language, that's when you begin to run into issues. And namely, there are certain exploits using JSON that allow you to overflow the native data types in Java, for example. Uh, but I'll leave that as an open discussion in the, in the forum, the discussion for this week. And then we talked about REST endpoints. I touched on them pretty quickly, but we'll see a little bit deeper description of them also in Wednesday's office hour, which is 8 p.m. Eastern time. But this week's assignment will give you some experience with designing your first REST endpoint. So you're going to install an Ubuntu VM, and then on top of it, you're going to install Python and a web framework called Flask, which is an extremely lightweight framework. And you're going to install, or excuse me, you're going to write your very own REST endpoint. It's a pretty straightforward endpoint, but I wanted you guys to see how it works and um, also discuss and think about some of the security concerns that, that we talked about here on the last slide. So if you have any questions, as always, please let me know. I hope the material is interesting, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the discussions and see you guys in office hours soon. Take care.